like me. Amen. We'll turn around, shake hands with your neighbor while we sing it. 244. Then we'll let you sit a spell.
And in that time, we, we made a big difference. We saved, uh, we saved a lot of babies. But we had, in the beginning, a real problem with uh, corruption in the police departments right, there. Right, right. And uh, I remember one time, uh, I was out preaching in front of a preach, uh, one of the uh, abortion mills, and two whores came up, and that's what they were. You say, well, how do you know? Well, if you'd heard them talking, you'd know, okay? But they tapped me on the shoulder when I turned around. They sprayed me with the, you know, right up close. And I called the police. And the police came out, and they went in. And what happens when they walk into the abortion mill, the abortionists, they'll tell them, the doctor's waiting for you in the office. And they'll go in there. There's no doctor, it's an abortionist, but he's not in there. Instead, there's an envelope with cash sticking out of it, sitting on a desk. And they go in, they take the cash, and they didn't even try to hide it. The cops come walking out with carrying an envelope of cash. And I said, I said, don't you guys make enough money? And they said, no, we don't. And by the way, preacher, people tell you they don't want to hear it, they don't want to hear it. That's all. They were laughing. They thought it was funny. Well, you know, I thought, well, you know, if these guys can't feed their family like they said it, Maybe I should help them. So what I did is I got their names and their badge numbers. First I went downtown and I made a complaint. And they thought that was funny at first in there. Uh, when uh, they told me, they said, well, you know, and this was a big, a big room like this filled with city workers and police workers. And they said, you know, when people don't want to hear it, Pastor, they don't want to hear it. And I said very loudly, yeah, you mean like John the Baptist? Herod didn't want to hear it. When John the Baptist said, Herod, you know, and everybody, this guy's going like, shh, because everybody in the office, you see, what you have to do is you have to let these folks know that uh, you mean what you're saying. Amen. So I did, I thought I'd, I'd help these cops. I got their names and their badge numbers. And I went on the radio, and I said, officer so-and-so badge number, and officer so-and-so at the 4th District. They can't make enough money, they said, to feed their family. So if any of you out there have anything uh, like dog fights or a cock fights or child porn, anything like this, you know, where you need people that have absolutely no morals, no values, will do anything for a dollar, call officer so-and-so over at the 4th District. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, he'll uh, do it for you. So uh, when I went back out there on Friday, there was always one police car would always be watching me. Now there's two. And so I was preaching and the car pulls up real slow and I thought, oh boy, here we go. We're going to be dancing out here. And uh, the cop pulls up and he turned to me, Officer Andy, who happens to listen to my radio program. And he said, hey, Pastor, he said, you see that car over there? And I said, yeah. He said, they're watching you. And uh, I said, well, they, they always do, he says, but it's different this time. He says, we're watching them. You see, you have to know something, that the word is in the department, that uh, whoever gets you, even if it's in the back, somebody needs to take you out. Okay? And so they said, that's why we're here. We've got your back as long as you're going to be out here. But by the way, we want to thank you for what you did, because not all of us are dirty. And those of us that are clean, we want to thank you uh, for what you did. Well. Uh, I had to wash my back for a little while, but that automatically stopped the police, the harassment from us. And, uh, there was another time when I was preaching at this worship mill, and an apostate preacher who had been working with the abortion mill came up from behind me, and he stuck a gun in my back. And uh, he said, I'm tired of hearing your preaching. I'm tired of it, and so were they. And he says, I'm going to end it today. And uh, so I kept preaching, and he says, don't you hear me? I'm going to blow a hole through you. So I said, look, if you're going to shoot me, shoot me. Talk to me to death. It's too painful. <laughs> <laughs> and folks, wouldn't you know, right there, I had led that security guard <coughs> to just two know. weeks earlier. This was, in fact, was his last day. The security guard at the abortion mill. He was watching the whole thing on the cameras. So he slipped around and got up and got the drop on this guy. But he called the police before he did. 
And you see there in Cleveland, everybody's on the payroll, okay? The abortion mills know who to pay. And so uh, he come up and he got a drop on this guy. And uh, this guy took off running. And he did his last day in a dive, he didn't want to shoot him. But he took off running. But he had been a, put a call in. And when the police heard the call, they heard Pastor Sanders and a gun. So the captain, you know, these people that were on the payroll decided that I had a gun. And they thought, this is finally we get it. So he came out and he had four men with him. And uh, these were all big young guys. And he comes over and uh, he said, where's the gun? And the security guard says, well, uh, he took it. He put it and he took off. He says, you mean pastor don't have a gun? He says, no. And I said, if you... If you'd have known that, you wouldn't have come, would you? He said, no, we probably wouldn't. And so, again, these people are dirty. And uh, I just stepped right up. And my nose was that close to his nose. I says, you have dishonored your God, your country, the uniform, and those men that gave their life for the oath that they took. I said, you are a whore and a prostitute. And I figured, here I go. I'm going to be cuffed again. Okay. But you know what this guy did? He looked at his men and he looked at him, he put his head down, he walked over, he got in his car and he drove away. Well, three of them come walking over towards me and I thought, here we go, because these were all young guys, half my age. And they just walked by and they didn't say anything. But the, the last one, he stood there and with his arms folded. And he said, do you know what? He said, everything you just said is true. And I said, if you know that young fellow, then why are you doing it? He says, because I do have to feed my family. And I said, you would be better to starve with integrity. Well, a few days later, he came up, he pulled up to the curb, and he says, you're absolutely right. He says, no more of this for me. He said, thanks, Pastor. So, you know, you have to stand your ground. From Genesis to Revelation, God's word the Bible teaches, resistance to tyranny is always obedience to God. Failure to resist tyranny is always disobedience to God. And so, over the years, we've had some very interesting times. And that's why I came up with this. And I'm going to leave this for you folks. This is the For Real True Christian Resistance form. And the instructions are on the back. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because we've got some very interesting times coming as Christians in this country. And uh, as you find yourself in court, we have had, we have had the, the ability. When we show up in court, everything changes. We've had case after case just thrown right out of the court because we were there. You see, in our judicial system there in Cleveland, guilt or innocence really has hardly anything to do with your case. And we've seen so many innocent people. I've been in a prison ministry for over 40 years. We have the largest death row ministry in the state. Five guys have gotten off of death row because they were innocent. Right now we've got Anthony Apanovich. 31 years on death row, and the prosecutor hides evidence, and they, they go unscathed. Okay? And they're going to be, in fact, speaking on Saturday. We have an All Lives Matter conference where we're bringing together three speakers on the pro-life jam porter, uh, Matt Lynch, who's a statesman, and Denver uh, Sally, who uh, writes tremendous articles. And then we've got... Uh, Officer J.T. Kurtz speaking on Blue Lives Matter, how what has been taking place has been affecting the police officers, uh, especially there at Cleveland. You might have seen a lot of the news about the, the shootings and that, and uh, they're going to tell you how they feel. And then we're going to have uh, these men from Death Row who spent all of these years, they're going to tell you how spending 24 years on Death Row, knowing you're innocent, but worse than that, how it's affected your family, because yes. it's destroyed the families. And then we're going to have uh, Richard Youngblood, and he's going to be talking about veterans' lives matter. So that's all a response to, uh, we've, <laughs> we've had uh, some confrontations with the Black Lives Matter group. Mm -hmm. Folks, these people are simply communists. They're hard communists where we're at up there. Uh, and they were uh, out there screaming. You had one woman dressed as an apostate preacher using profanity. And they were cursing the police. The ironic thing, the only police were there behind me. Uh, 
were black. And they were calling them murderers and everything. And the, the police officer that was standing behind me was about this tall. And he was a, a pitiful little police officer. And they're screaming at him, and he's just standing there. So I turned around, and I said, you don't look like a murderer. Are you a murderer? He goes like this. <laughs> he doesn't know what to do. He said, but anyhow, uh, I confronted him. And I said, what you ought to be doing is you ought to be going over to Planned Predators out there, where we're at. And they have killed more human beings than any army in the world. And uh, they, they existed for the sole purpose of eliminating the black race. That's, right, yeah. That's why they exist, to eliminate the black race. Mm -hmm. And I said, you ought to be out there. And, and uh, the woman screamed, we support Planned Parenthood. And uh, the other one said, there is no God and there is no Bible. I said, that's where you're wrong. There is a God. He wrote the Bible, and he talks about you. You're a fool. That's right. And uh, so I walked over to the leaders and said, see, they were blasting you. Yes. And Kevin saw this. This was an amazing night. you got to picture this, folks. Working for the Lord, you never have a boring day. Now just picture this. Here's Black Lives Matter. Here's me. And behind me, on top of the building, this was at the Republican Party uh, debate, the first debate. <laughs> the federal marshals from high the scopes, and they're pointing them at these black <laughs> guys because they're carrying bags. Yeah. And they didn't know what was in these bags. But between them and the bags is me. So, those, <laughs> so all the time I'm walking around, I got these rifles aimed at my back, you know. And I'm thinking, uh, gee, I hope it's the back and not the head, you know. But, uh, anyhow, so they were blaspheming God, and I, and I walked over to them and I said, look, I will never believe what you believe, but I'm going to tell you something. You will believe every word that proceeded forth from the mouth of God. There is no chance that won't happen. There is none. And when I said that to them, they all backed up. They quit screaming. They all started going back and up. And those marshals were looking like, what did he do? What did he say to them? They were curious, you know. But God's word doesn't return void. Amen. And so, uh, because of that, because we end up in court a lot, if you're an activist, you're going to be there. We have these, and these forms I'm going to leave here for you. And they just tell you about how to be a courtroom observer. And what we do, we simply have files for all the different counties around to where we live. And when they pull one of our people in, now listen, we're courtroom observers. When somebody petitions us to come in, we show up. We're not coming there to say, you know, to prejudge anything, we're simply there as courtroom observers. Mm -hmm. Well, they sent out, uh, supposedly from the FBI, but it wasn't, it was sheriff's deputies who were calling, and they were calling people who had been in the court to find out if I had told them to go down and intimidate the judge. And, uh, of course, everybody started calling me and saying, they're asking, they're wanting to know. And I said, what'd you tell them? No, we just told them that you said go in and Take your pad and your paper and write down what happened. And see, with me, a number of, because, uh, see, evil and wickedness likes darkness. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that radio program, you know, we reach over six million people a night. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't like the light. That's right. And that's what, again, has helped us uh, there in our pro-life stand. That's why we've saved so many babies. Uh, we've had, you know, the police, I mean, some real run-ins in the early days. But I went after them. When you go after them, they, they back away. And now, the very ones that used to go after us, they're actually supporting us in a lot of ways. Huh? Out there, because they saw that we're not going to back down. Yes. We're not going to run. We're going to stand our ground. We're going to fight. Mm -hmm. Now, over the years, we've had some interesting times, folks, uh, doing the Lord's work. Uh, one time, we were out, number five, seven circle. This is abortion mill was up on the sixth floor and uh, in this building at the first floor they had a coffee shop and always parking they will the opposition will always try to make it so we had no place to park so what I always do is I go in and I tell all our people go in and buy a cup of coffee or sandwich or something once you have patronized that place in the state of Ohio the law says you can park there all day long <laughs> all day long once you pay so 
I went in there, and I did like I always do, bought my coffee, and I come out, and this young police officer comes over. They called the police on me, and they said, sir, you're going to have to move your, your car. The management wants you to move your car. I said, well, I'll do that, but I said, if I do that, you know, uh, you're going to have to have everybody else in that, you know, a couple hundred cars. They have to move their cars, too, or I'm going to have to sue you personally. I don't want to do that, but I will have to sue you personally. He said, do you have to? I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm going to call the sergeant. So he calls the sergeant. Sergeant comes down. I told him the same story. He said, well, i got to call my sergeant. So he called his sergeant. His sergeant comes down. And then he said, well, I'm going to call the captain. So the captain comes down. The captain also happens to be going to law school. He's that fellow you see advertising now all the time. An attorney now, today. Anyway. <coughs> Anyhow, so he comes down. Now, I've got this great big sign. you got to see this. It's a big sign. And on one side, it's got a bucket. We cut a bucket in half, and we put the bucket on the side, one on the other side. And on one side, you got, we had this uh, little doll hanging out. It's got abortion. It's got red paint all over it. looks like blood. This is death. And then over here, we had this pretty little baby doll, black, okay? And uh, so I'm standing there holding that sign, and the police are all there. And... We're discussing what's going on, and I handed them all these flyers showing abortion. I said, look, fellas, let me ask you a question. This is what they're doing right there on the sixth floor at the Little Americans. This is what they're doing right now, and you're out here hassling me. Does that make sense to you? I says, I want to show you something else. So I asked the sergeant, could you hold this? So the sergeant's holding my sign. <laughs> you got two cars parked across the driveway with a red light going, doing exactly what I couldn't do, and that's blocking the traffic from going in there. And here's the sergeant holding the sign. And just at that moment, who comes in but their ACLU attorney? He stops and he says, and he uses some, some bad language, the F wow. And he says, what the blankety blank are you doing here? And uh, the captain said, hold it. One more word out of you, and I'm going to arrest you. Now just give me one more word. And he didn't. So the captain said, you know what? told the, the old officer, you go in there, you tell them the Pastor Sanders can park here anytime he wants if there's a problem to see me. <laughs> so that ended, up, ended my parking problems. Folks. But right out there at that same place, we had, well, first of all, how the Lord bless us. Uh, I was standing there preaching one day, and all of a sudden, a strange thing happened. Dirt comes shooting straight up out of the ground. And then I realized why. I heard the gunshots. I looked behind me, and there was a fellow over in a tree line with a high-power rifle, and he's shooting at me. But he's not a very good shot. And they come close, okay? So what's the first thing they teach you in the military? When you come under fire, charge the fire. So that's what I did. I charged the fire. Unfortunately, he's about half my age. And so he ran away faster than I could catch him, okay? But right there, one day, we had uh, an operation rescue, but it was not at that abortion mill. It was over at Chester. My job was to get all of the Satanists and all of the pro-deathers away from over there, over to where I was. So all week long, what I did is I'd go on the radio. I said, 7 o'clock, Saturday morning, number 5, 7 circle, light against darkness, good against evil, life against death. Be there. So I went out there and they had the whole, this is like a mall. They had the whole place closed up. And here you had, uh, there was somewhere in the area of about 80 Satanists out there. They had their satanic uh, buttons and all of their blasphemy on. And the police had set up a police line. I had five people with me. Now, at that place, they had an injunction against me. And there's there's two driveways. So on either side of the driveway, there's an aisle, and then in the middle, there's an aisle. And the injunction said that the only people that could be on those aisles, I was limited, I couldn't go off those aisles, uh, would be people that were in concert with me. Well, they never explained what that meant. Did they sing with me or did they yeah. dance with me? I didn't know. <laughs> but I knew that. Uh, so when the police came out there, and uh, uh, 
captain came over and said, you're going to rescue this place? I said, look. I said, do you want to have some fun? He said, what kind of fun? I said, do you want to avoid a lot of paperwork? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want to avoid it. What do we do? I said, we're going to do some theatrics out here, and if you go along and keep these people here, you guys can avoid a whole lot of paperwork. Okay. He said, I'm in. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I went over and I stood on my aisle, and here come this fellow. His name was John, great big guy, and he literally had buttons saying, blaspheming Christ and saying things I can't even tell you what he said. Now, he wasn't supposed to be on my aisle. Now, I have the police behind me, and John's in front of me, and they're watching over here, lying down the road, are all the Satanists. So John's their leader. He's a evil. He comes over, and uh, up to this time, I had this guy would call it on the radio program, and he would say, we will defeat you. Yeah. Your Jesus is weak. You know, and this, it was going on. And sometimes it'd be a pretty wicked voice. So I, I walked over to him, and he wasn't supposed to be there. And uh, like I said, the police were behind me. And I said, you know what your problem is, boy? I said, your only problem is... You ain't got no guts, and I'm poking him in the chest. <laughs> I'm poking him in the chest, and he's getting, he's getting, he can almost see smoke coming out. And I said, here's the problem, boy. I says, I can prove my Jesus right now. You can never point and prove your, your devil to me. I said, he said, I'm not afraid of you or your Jesus. I said, if you're not afraid, boy, why don't you just do what I want to tell you? He, what? I says, just say this in his prayer. If you're not afraid, if there is no Jesus, I said, take my hand. Well, he did. He took my hand. I trusted in the Lord. Okay? He took my hand, and we said the sinner's prayer. And you had to have been there to see this. And I wish the young people could see this. This guy didn't even look the same. Within minutes, his entire countenance had changed. He was crying. Okay. And I turned around, and the police were like this. <laughs> oh, okay. They were watching, and uh, the captain came up and said, what did, you, what did you do? I said, give him the Lord's Prayer. Wow, he said. And now the Satanists were watching this fellow. He was as good as dead. Now that he did that, he took my hand in front of all of them. Yes. And he, he said, thank you. He said, thank you, Pastor. He says, Jesus spoke to me, like you said. And he said, he was right. Jesus just spoke to me, he said. And so now he couldn't go back. He had to go. So he went through both the police line and he went over to, and to talk to my people and told them things. And the police made sure that he could get out of there before and they could get him. But I never heard from him after that. Uh, but boy, I'm going to tell you. See, God will never, ever let you down. Okay? God will always honor your commitments. You just got to have the courage. And That's right. One time we were out over on Carnegie. It's another abortion mill over there. And Roger Simmons was a uh, he was a Cleveland police officer. He was about 400 pounds. Great big guy. And he moonlighted over there uh, with his whole uniform on and everything. And he's about as unsaved as you can get. He would play the most god-awful music, uh, horrible stuff, loud, whenever I would start preaching. Well, one day we're out there, and the doors you could see out from inside, but you couldn't see him. And he would stand inside there. And the same thing, all the Satanists come out. Okay. And while I was there, I was preaching, because the witches were hanging out the windows. They were hanging out the windows up on the third floor. And while I was preaching to him, somebody came up from behind me and grabbed me from behind. Uh, and I thought it was one of the saints. So I spun around and I grabbed her by the throat. And it was a woman. And she was gurgling. You could see she was a demon possessed. And so I just, I had my hand on her shoulder. Dan, you'd have to see this. I'm going to tell you, I don't think anybody's more surprised than me. 
And I simply said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. This woman lifted up off the ground. She lifted up off the ground and she shot back 10 feet. Now, we're at the bottom of a hill here. And there's a wall. And as you go up the hill, the wall gets smaller, okay? Uh, she rolls up this wall. And then she starts rolling down. And she's saying, listen to the man.